Um, so thank you, Sher, for an amazing introduction. I'm so honored to uh, be here one of, as the speaker here, because I'm supposed to be like, I don't have a much of insights really to um, give all experts here. So I will try my best to give some valuable or helpful information in, um, in the range of what I know. So the tutorial title of what we'll deal with is dealing with the lack of audio data. Um, and my name is Choi Lee, and I'm from South Korea. So this is my photos of what I uh, took in two days of my uh, staying here in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Uh, I almost got killed of taking these selfies. One, I was up on this wall, like walls, was it AL walls? Uh, like walls of Jerusalem, and, of the old city. And then if you can see, that's like the cliff. So I almost like, I, I, I look confident, but I'm like <laughs> shivering right now. And then here, uh, this is from the other side of the monastery of St. John. And this is also a cliff. And I jumped to um, put it in my Facebook and tell my friends that I almost got, like I almost fell from the cliff. And these are also amazing experience I had in the two days of my uh, stay here in Israel. So I'm so thankful for inviting me. Okay, so to introduce myself uh, briefly, well, I would first like to kind of do some sales of why this tutorial could be meaningful. Well, like in the deep learning field, there are so many good tutorials and um, especially so many good lectures of like cutting edge papers and like technologies. But I thought that there would be like, there's a, this gap of actual hands-on uh, tutorial of dealing the ta hands-on tasks in deep learning. So you have th this amazing talks like um, of papers and technologies, sharings uh, and like in conferences. But then like, even if we hear all those insights, it's very different if you go on hands-on and try to implement that. So this hands-on tutorial would um, make you feel confident about actually now we can get the hang of actually doing this technology or this kind of methods. So this hands-on tutorial will be, um, I hope this could give you some glimpse of um, getting the process that I prepared. So before we actually go on, I, I would like to ask you some questions. So I'm not sure like how much experience you have with deep learning. So um, can you put your, raise your hands if you have like, are you familiar with the concepts of deep learning? How many? Okay, almost everyone. Have you, um, do you have experience, like implementation experience with deep learning? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I started deep learning uh, three years ago when there was this legendary Go battle between Sero Lee, who's a proud Korean um, Go champion, and uh, DeepMind, DeepMind's AlphaGo. So it was like a huge boom in Korea. So then I was like a freshman in high school and I started uh, studying machine learning by myself and through uh, many good communities in Korea. And then I worked as an intern in um, IRI, which is Artificial Intelligence Research Institute. And this is where I actually got my first field experience and where I learned how to do, um, how to stable, stabilize GAN training and so on and so on. And then like Sher told, told uh, introduced, uh, I went to Deep Learning Camp Jeju with, where, where I met Eyal. So here I uh, researched something called conditional wave GAN which is um, so like it, which is using GANs to actually um, syn synthesize raw audio. And then I had some Google related stuff. This is Jeffy. <laughs> so Google related stuff where I wrote some TQ tutorials. Uh, and, what, and I also did some Parkinson's disease related uh, diagnosis mod classifier building experiment. And I went to New Europe where I met Professor Sutton and got his signature. And then this conditional wave again poster at uh, WIMO, Women in Machine Learning Workshop. So the reason why I prepare the tutorial as um, dealing with the lack of audio data is because I had a hands-on experience with actually tackling this kind of task. Um, so when I try to build a classification model for, um, for, for class classification model for Parkinson's disease 
um, diagnosis based on speech data. Now, since it's a medical data and it's generally very difficult to obtain quite amounts of medical data for um, deep learning, I had to do some several tricks to um, to train to have a quite amount of accuracy in this task. So um, that way, I did some startup related things. I went to Maker Fair with the with just um, tackling the same problem for for more than two years. So that's why we're trying to do, do um, with this title, dealing with the lack of audio data. And although it's we're trying to deal with the lack of audio data, this kind of um, methods can also be used in image domains and um, text and videos because it's all related. So to just give a brief overview, um, our area we're going to do we're ha going to have a scenario of doing a speech classification where we'll, we will um, deal with transfer learning or in generative models to do data augmentation. And then the targeted audience of this hands-on tutorial is people who are familiar with deep learning concepts but have a very shallow experience, a hands-on implementation experience with deep learning. So since it's a hands-on, it can't be like uh, really like a deep, keen insight uh, content. So if, uh, so actually like the whole, the insights of this tutorial can be summarized in like five minutes, but since we have to go tackle on the very basic and the uh, bottom line of all of these techniques, we're trying to um, go over with two, two hours of uh, your very valuable time. And the setup is we're going to do in a Python 3.6 with TensorFlow. So um, you, did you receive my mail before coming here? And did you install all the setups? Yeah, okay. So the table of contents is, we're first going to start with the motivation and then going to go on with the baseline classifier, which is going to set up the whole scenario for this task and then do some augmentation of noise augmentation, transfer learning, GAN generation style transfer, and then we're gonna compare and contrast all of these methods, then conclude. Uh, so motivation, so data augmentation is, as you all know, as data scientists, is to add information to base data from internal or external sources, uh, where it's traditionally, it has been to use in, in an internal way, but then now with, uh, with the advance of cell transfer and um, GAN augmentations, now we're trying to use some external sources um, that are quite far, transfer learning, um, to use external sources to augment our data. And deep learning, in deep learning, it, data augmentation is so necessary that you can actually, uh, regardless of how much data you have, you can, gain, you can lead to a performance gain and make the model robust against this data noise uh, and generalize your model. And it's fairly well developed in the image domain because images are quite um, relatively easy to handle as a data, as a raw data, but audio are not. Because audio are 1D vector wrapped in um, WAV file, so these are usually very, very lengthy compared to the images. So like an image data in deep learning, when it goes to convolutional neural networks, the dimension of it are like 64 by 64, um, 100, 128 by 128, but that's like one second of like uh, audio data is like length of 16,821 or like six, 60,000 length of 1D vector, which makes it very hard to generate. And it's very hard to handle um, in this case. And, um, and we also have to listen it to check its fidelity. Like in images, you can just, when you do GAN trainings, you can just check with your eyes to see it, whether it's, um, its generation is complete or not. Then audio, you have to uh, manually listen to it. And there are not many um, methods to check its fidelity uh, uh, that we will talk later. And a few data augmentation options than those of images. So we will specifically deal with audio data, but like I, like I told you, it, this is going to be very related to the image domain because uh, in deep learning, the standard way to deal audio data is to convert them into spectrum images. So uh, it will be somewhat similar to the image domain and, and the techniques I today we're going to go over are 
or can be applied in the vision area, but then in the audio, it's like you you can't really. So like by looking at this spectrum image, we don't know whether this image is well generated or not. So this makes it very difficult to handle these kind of data. So the scenario today, um, this is a very contrived scenario set. So the task here is to classify one second utterance of their zero through nine. So this is an MNIST um, of speech. So there's a, so we have 10 classes and then we're going to convert the audio files into spectrum images. So it's just like MNIST classification task, but that the um, data are just uh, spectrum images of these in utterances. And this data is called SCO9, which is speech command zero through nine, released by the TensorFlow team. Uh, total, we have 38,907 files, and um, it's divided into about four and, and a one proportion. So the classifier we will use is AlexNet, uh, which is the first deep learning model to achieve meaningful results in, and this Alexson model is very simple and light, so we can actually do some inferences with your own laptops. And to do so, we first have to clone um, this repository. Right now, we will do that together. I'm very nervous since I'm coding right in front of so many people. <laughs> so let's just go into github.com and at check guitar which is also my rap name. I'm a rapper. <laughs> and with underscore tutorial, and then you can go in. So this is the repository that we will um, do everything here. There's every um, data augmentation techniques in this repository. So let's clone this repository. Okay, I will just clone it in my root directory. Okay. This repository also contains some sample data files that we will deal with, um, part of the SC09 data set. Since we can't actually train all the, fully, fully train the models at this point, I already uh, prepared the pre-trained models that I believe you all downloaded before coming here. Uh, so we will use pre-trained models, we will load the weights, and then using the sample files in this repository, we will test um, the accuracy, the validation accuracy, and so on. Okay. It's taken quite a time to clone this. Okay. So while we were waiting, I'll briefly explain you the file structure of this repository. Now this is the classifier, the baseline classifier we have. And this is the AlexNet files here. So the train.py and model.py, you can use it by yourself. But now it's all yours to train later on with, um, with, the, with this kind of task or any kind of tasks. And um, specifically, we will use this Jupyter notebook file, IPython file, tutorial.ipynb to do some um, demonstration tasks in this tutorial. And then we have this data directory inside the classifier. So this data directory is to train this AlexNet. And this data directory are composed of txt files. So the text file, each text file is composed of the um, path of the each training data space, the la class label. Oh, and during this tutorial, uh, since we're in a table, we should like, sh please share, and if you have questions, you can just please help each other to come along. And we'll also, um, in, in the, during the tutorial, so we will have like a QA rounds after each method, like a very free session. So I'll just come down and help, um, one by one, if you have any like pro errors, problems during the steps. So, so these are the text files of training data. So that's the path. 
which will always differ by where you put it, and then space the class label, which is supposed to be 0 to through 10. Oh, 0 through 9, of course. Are we done with the cloning? <laughs> no, we're not. Um, and the actual data, the sample data, are in this data directory. So in this data directory, we have the background noise we will use in the first augmentation technique, and then the SCO9 data. So this is composed of 10 classes, and each of them have, have has three WAV files. So this is just a sample of the 38,000 SCO9 data set. So that's the core part of the repository we will um, manage. Okay. So a disclaimer. So this is a very contrived scenario to kind of go over all the data augmentation techniques. So um, just remember to have all of these options in your hand so that you can freely just apply within your um, needs and all of these methods are not like, it, they will not work 100%. So just by having these sets, you have to, you can experiment and um, if, that, if that works, you can actually apply to your own task, custom task. Okay, so the first step of our tutorial is to build the baseline model. Now, um, this is an AlexNet model. It's composed of five convolutional neural networks and three fully connected layers but I removed the two fully connected layers in the end for this tutorial. So we have five convolutional layers and one fully connected layer. So the whole scenario of this baseline model is that you put an audio WAV file, which is composed of WAV file, and then we're going to convert it into spectrum images. So this spectrum image um, is, to, is, is a process we use fast Fourier transform, which I think most of you will know. Um, so this is just to accumulate this, um, to fast forward transfer to approximate these frequency values and make it into like this one um, is to the values in the color heat map. And then the, it, and then this image will go through convolutional neural network which accepts image inputs and then with the fully connected layer, this last fully connected layer has 10, um, which uh, each of the each of the each of the element has the probability of each class, and that's the way we will output the classification result. So the first step of the tutorial is to actually do this part to convert these WAV files into spectrogram images. Now, um, this will we will do this in a Jupyter notebook which is located in, in classifier, AlexNet, and then tutorial.ipynb. Anyone who's cloning finished? Uh, okay. Okay, mine is done. So the first step of the, um, what we're going to do is we're going to load the training data to just listen to some um, data of this SCO9 data set. So I'll just go on and since this is a demonstration, you can, when, you, you, when you're complete with, complete with the cloning, you can follow the steps. And I went into the directory of this uh, WIDS tutorial classifier AlexNet. So now I'm going to type in Jupyter Notebook. Um, how many people cloning done? Raise your hands, please. Okay, so the first step here, we're just going to load the training data from our 
um, SC09 data structure, which is in the root directory of the whole repository and then data. So this is to first get the label path, which means um, it's going to get the data in the data SC09 directory. We're just going to get all of the um, all of the class labels, the path of the class labels. And then this gets the each of the WAV files in, the, in each of the class label. And then here we're just going to grab just one, the first one, and then display it with IPython display. So. So if we listen to some of the files, see like this kind of um, data are really hard to predict, hard to use. So that's why we're doing some of the augmentation techniques, adding noises or traditional augmentation techniques to just generalize these kind of hard cases, this kind of ones. Okay. Now let's do the first step of converting wave image wave files into images. So to prepare the training data. So to do so, we're going to use um, especially matplotlib to plot these spectrogram images. Reading the wave file can be done with wave file using the SciPy um, library. And then here, when you read this sample wave, um, this is the directory name, the path of this, I'll just print out one. So this is the directory of one sample wave files. And then by putting this into wavefile.read, then this data will be the actual um, one-dimensional one vector of the wave files. And this is just to, if it's um, longer than one second, which is 16,000 here, um, it's just going to pad it. No, if it's longer, then we're just gonna cut it, and if it's shorter, then we're gonna pad it to fill the um, blanks. And this is the part where we actually look, make these spectrum images, um, this is the line here, and if you see, we're doing num the number of FFT Fourier transform is 512 data plots. But since the overlapping are 384, we're striding. The window is striding by 128. So this is where we make the spectrum image that looks like this of each file, and then we're going to show it. Show it here in the Jupyter Notebook, and then save, also save it. So to set its name, um, this minus four is the part where it says dot wave. So we're just going to cut that and put JPG. So the file name is the same, but just the extension is different. And this is how, this is where spectrum images are created, and these white places are where the where it's padded to zero. Okay, so these are the the six six is converted into this kind of spectrum images. In our tutorial repository, now the data originally had only three WAV files each, but now it has three J, um, corresponding JPG files of each WAV file, all of them. So originally, if we want to train um, a classifier with these converted image files, in this, you can do it, also do it by yourself with this repository. Then we have to, in this, in this case, we have to turn it to a text file, right? So that can be done here, processing. This is the root directory. Processing and then file to you can use file to text dot py to actually make a text file and then um, train your own classi classifier. But here, uh, since we can't train the model right now, so we have all of the pre-trained models. 
these ones that um, you're supposed to download it before coming here. So we're going to use these pre-trained models to simply just inference uh, with these these JPG files. So the place where all of these checkpoints of the classifier is going to go is classifier. And then here you're going to create a folder name called training. We're going to, you can move it or copy and paste it at this point. So each um, pre-trained model, so these are the pre-trained models for each augmentation technique we'll go over. So the, for the baseline classifier, um, we have a checkpoint and the flags that we use to train this model and then a tensor board. So um, I already trained the model. Now let's see, check its tensor board to see how the training went. So this is the virtual environment that my TensorFlow is located. Um, I will go into classifier training. Now we want to check out the tensor board of this baseline directory. So we can just tensor board, log directory, baseline. Pardon? Tensor board? Oh, the tensor board is, I'll, yeah, I'll just show you. So, tensor board is just like logging the iteration, the steps of the training process, like in a visual way. So, if you see, you can just automatically know what it is. See, so this is, this is like tensor board is a very, very useful tool. Um, that everyone in deep learning, if you use TensorFlow, use to um, just see how the process goes. So if you um, have the data and then you start training, then you can also print all of the losses in your command line. So in this common comm command line, but then it's always good to see how the process is going visually. So um, rather than CLI, you can you you should make use of this tensor board to see how the training goes. And then you can also decide whether to stop it or not. Or is this model, if you see the losses, if it's spiking, um, then you can, uh, let's start over, let's go back, is there something wrong? You can check um, in the train accuracy and the validation accuracy by, so this is the train accuracy, that's like um, the, what the model is actually training with. So we have to always, um, check, test it with the validation set, which is different from the training set. So these are the te test set, validation sets that the model has never looked. So um, most of the cases, it's logical that the validation accuracy is lower than train accuracy. But if this um, difference, if this delta is too high, then we have to uh, be suspicious of overfitting, which is most like uh, mostly like the model may be just simply memorizing the features of the data set, not just generalizing and finding the features that uh, if it's a classification model, then the real features that are separating zero from one and one from two and these kind of things. So this is a very, very beautiful accuracy and loss model, which you, which Mostly, when, when I'm training um, my models, I'm doing OCR-related uh, OCR related works. And when I'm training my models, I, I never see this kind of beautifully optimized accuracy in loss graph. But this is because the task is so um, easy, just classifying, like just MNIST, class, classifying just 10 classes of utterances. So the class classification um, with the baseline model went fairly well. And if we see the validation accuracy, the final validation accuracy is point, if you see the value, the value is 0 0.0421, which is 
94.2%, which is the uh, baseline accuracy that we will start with. So now we have the baseline, and then we will do some data augmentation techniques with the SEO9 data set we have to try, we will try to increase this accuracy. Okay, now, um, is everyone at this page? You can, you should first be in this uh, with tutorial classifier training. So where our pre-trained models are located. Now, each pre-trained model has this tensor board directory, which is, uh, has train and val and each of these events are the um, logs that we want to open and the, we, we have to write down tensor board and the log directory. So the directory we want to look at which is going to be dot baseline, um, current directory baseline. And then um, you can use the port, if you, or if you don't, it will just um, locally just give you 6006. But for me, I just enter the port. And then you will see this link for your tensor board with the port here. So if you don't type the port, then it's just going to give you 6006. So it doesn't matter. But if you, when you, when you have to uh, view multiple of tensor boards, then you usually use ports. And when you're in a, like, a remote server, that's when you use ports, yeah. So, are we on the same page? Any issues? Oh, how did I get this point? Oh, this screen. So, this is the link here. When you type this command, then there will be a URL of uh, your tensor board. Then you can just go to any just web page um, and then type in this link. Okay, then we will um, go on to the first step of data augmentation. Okay. So, um, the first thing you can actually do is you can use, always use the traditional methods. So, this kind of area is, um, in audio data, it's signal processing, which has very, very long history, and um, they have very good techniques to actually um, synthesize, like source separation, and so on, and in the augmentation techniques, there are a number of ways to do it. For example, you can shift the pitches of a person because uh, when we're trying to class, try, trying to train with person speech, human speech data, then we all have different voices and we all have um, uh, pitches, different behaviors, amplitude. So we need our model to just ignore these kind of individuals' variances, but just to realize the important, just to identify the important features that actually classify um, our main task, which is to classify 10 utterances of numbers, 10 classes of utterances. So um, that's how we generalize, like give, give more noises to the model so that it could um, ignore those kind of points. Now you can also stretch, time stretch, time stretch just, and adding noises or padding, just like uh, what we did before, just padding if, it's, if, there's the, if there's a blank. But in this case, you can just compress it and pad it to give some noises of your original data. Then, so in this part, we're just going to do the noisy part because um, these kind of methods are not every day used in, um, at this point. But here, noises, um, adding noises are very, very commonly used. Now, when we say noise, we can, there's two meanings. One noise is like just artificial noises. Now, you can just add like um, uh, same length of Gaussian distribution, and that could be a noise if you add it. 
But here, what we're going to do is an actual noise, a practical noises of everyday life, like background noises, um, dishwashing, or like bicycles. Now, these adding noises can uh, help your model uh, when it works in a real, real life task. So if there's like, so AI speakers, now AI speakers recognize what you're saying, that's ASR, automatic speech recognition. And most cases, these automatic speech recognition system will have to deal with noises, um, background noises, which can sometimes, like, since audio data is not just like one plus one is two, but then um, the, when you're adding some noises, then the whole signal is going to be uh, disturbed. So now you have, you, you have to add some noises in your um, original data, then we will have to, you will have to um, control the frequency of how much data of your, how much data of your whole data set you will add no noises. So in this scenario, here we have the uh, six background noises, also released by TensorFlow team. But these six noises are, um, if you try to use these noises to cover our world's, our world's noises, then this will be very um, scarce. So we will try to add these noises into our speech command zero through nine data set. That's the first augmentation technique here. So um, to add noise to train data, now we will set the noise frequency, which is um, which means that we will um, add noises to eighty percent of the data. We set the noise path, which is here, all of these WAV files, and then okay, let's first listen to the noises. So these are the noises that we will add. Can you hear them? Yeah. So these noises. So these are some of the noises that we can add. Um, now adding the wave, um, adding the noise file, we will have to first random um, the list of the wave files that we have. And then, so this part is where we actually add the background noise. So the method is just very simple, you just add um, a noise data to just your original data. So if there's a 1D vector of our WAV file, SEO9, then you just add the noise data directly. But before we do that, since noise data are longer than um, the length of our um, SEO9 data, we first have to adjust its size, the length, and then add it here. But when we do this, now this if is to guarantee that we're only adding um, the percent, the 80% here, noise frequency, 80% of the WAV files we have. So by doing this, we actually have this noise data, which, see, there's this noise added just to the data, and only 80% of the files here. So now since these WAV files are, again, WAV files, so we have to convert them into spectrogram images, so we'll go to the top of this Jupyter notebook, so wave to image section, and then since we don't want to convert 
all WAV files, you can just add uh, this part after the asterisk. Then add it. So it's converting only the WAV files. Now we have um, all spectrogram images of WAV files that we have. Okay. So here, um, the augmented text, augmented train.txt is where I actually train the noisy files with the noisy files. So using these data now added um, noisy augmented data, then we can again train the outset model. Now we're going to open another tensor board for what I for the pre-trained models of this noisy with this noisy data. And this noisy checkpoint is located also in the training directory. Noisy. So like we just opened this um, this tensor board, we can just cancel this first. And then just do noisy. Yep. Then it will give you the same link. So we can just directly go with them and reload this. So this will be the noisy augmentation. The training went quite well. But if you see the um, validation accuracy, okay. now it's here, it's 94.15. What was it before? Now, the four, before one was 94.21, so there was a bit of uh, validation accuracy drop in this case. Um, this can be explained because our validation test, the validation actually occurred with the validation set, which has no noise. So in this case, um, it could probably uh, be, be like, it could probably, this noise added addition ha could, could have dropped the accuracy here. But if you're using this model um, in a real time, so for example, when I was doing this Parkinson's disease diagnosis, then I had to add noises, uh, quite a lot of noises um, to the training data since we have to diagnose the um, Parkinson's disease in, a, in a real time in the real world, not with just clean data that's recorded in, in like this case, recorded with a uh, good microphone quality in a studio environment. So this was the first data augmentation technique and which is very, very simple. And we will um, try to compare all of the accuracies later on after we just go through all. So this is like the first thing that you can just think of. You can just add noises simply. And now this is like the most uh, more general, like what we use in the modern days. So transfer learning is um, a research field, a very huge research field of where there is a task A, then uh, we try to store the knowledge that we gained from task A and restore it when we do a similar but different task B. So for example, um, if the task A is to classify um, cars, then we can use the knowledge gain from classifying cars to classify trucks, for example. Um, the, how we do this is now when we train a classifier for task A, there will be weight values that are learned by classifying this task A. And then what we can do is we can bring this weight values, just exactly the same weight values, to the classification of task B, 
So, which means that the model architecture has to be the same. And we just freeze these weight values. But since now, the second step is called fine tuning. So, since these task A and task B is different, it's related, but it's different. So, um, we also need to fine tune the knowledge we gain from task A to task B. So, this fine tuning is um, done by training a few layers in the back, in the output part. So usually that's done by, um, you can add a fully connected layer or you can just simply um, change some model architecture. Here it's like this blocks are convolutional layers and these are fully connected layers. So in this, in this picture, this person just um, have the same convolutional layer and then add the convolutional layer and then the fully connected, which is different from, for, from these four parts. So um, when you freeze these weights, you only are going to train these three layers. So your optimizer in this classification model will only train these three layers. So now if you go into AlexNet, there's this train.py and model.py. Now I'm just going to compare, you don't have to uh, follow this part. Now I'm just gonna compare how they're different in, in, in a code, code level. So now this is the train.py and this is the fine tune.py, which, which does the same thing. But this one is the training of the task A and this one is the training of task B. So in this scenario, this is going to be, we're first going to train our base model with uh, a larger data set that deals with human voices. So what we're expecting is to, if we have more data set of human voices, um, then this model will uh, have some knowledge about human voices, the, to ignore the characteristics of pitches, the, variances in individuals' voices, um, we, we would, we're expecting this to bring the knowledge gain from um, this task to our task, which is to classify a, a specifically 10 classes. So now in train.py, so I'll just tell you what's different here. Um, okay. Now, Model training begins by first make, setting the placeholder, which is like just like the buckets, the variables, where there are no values, but where we will feed the values later on in the training process. And then we set the model. Model, which is the exact convolutional layers, AlexNet model. And then we define the losses. But here, now we have this train layer specifically defined. So each layer will have the name, and then uh, what we want to do is this train layers, so as a default, it's going to be FC8, FC7, FC6, which is just fully connected, three fully connected layers. So when we set these as train layers, now by splitting this, there, it will be a list of um, three fully connected layers. And then, uh, when you set the optimizer, now here, it, we just set the optimizer, atom optimizer, just right away in one queue. You say, with this learning rate, we will minimize the loss. But here, now we have this train, we won't only want to optimize the train layers. So what we do is, now we have to go into um, model, optimize. So we're, we're setting the same Atom optimizer with the learning rate, minimize loss, but what's different is we're going to add the variable list. So the layers that we will uh, want to specifically train. And this list comes from here, the train layers that we set. Now when you uh, want to uh, manipulate this, now when you want to use it by yourself, and I want to change these. So the names are defined when you uh, make, create the model. So here, this is where you actually create the model architecture. And you will see that each of the layer has a name.
right? So you can just call these, list these names for the fully trained layers, uh, for, the, for the layers that you want to train. And like I said, two models are going to be different, but the front parts, like this, uh, like this image, the front parts are going to be the same architecture, but then the back parts are going to be different uh, for the layers that we want to train. So here in this task, um, so the original AlexNet model that we are using as a baseline classifier model has, like I told you in the first, um, first period, like it's like just, we have five convolutional layers and then just one fully connected layer, which has the elements of number of classes. But here, now you'll see that these are the different parts. So these are the different parts. Now it has fully conv five convolutional layers and then a fully connected layer, which is the sixth layer, and another fully connected layer, and another fully connected layer, which is um, the number of classes. So now we have three fully connected layers in the back part. So these are the FC6, FC7, and FC8 for the name. Now these are the layers that we're specifically training with the optimizer right here. So the, for as a default, now the training layer, train layers is FC8, FC7, FC6. Now we set the model and now we have to actually train the model with the iteration, right? So before we do that, now like this scenario, we have to load the weights from the task A to our task B, right? Now, um, loading weights is in TensorFlow, you can just use a saver and then um, just to do a simple function, saver.restore. Like I do here in the training, just the um, original classifier, where if you want to, if you stop the training and then if you want to resume the training, you can just restore it by saying resume and you get it from the checkpoint, where this is the saved model during your process. So this is what you do usually. But here, what we want to do is we want to restore only some of the layers that are the, in this case, the front five convolutional layers. So to do so simply, um, I made this load original weights um, function and then added a argument, skip layers. So now the skip layers have to be trained layers, right? And uh, this will make our model to load the weights of the front layers that we don't want to train. So this is done by using a NumPy file. So if there is the weights of all convolutional layers and fully connected layers, there will be biases and weights in each layer. So we want to save these in a, in a NumPy file so that if we load it and um, if, the, if each layer, which is the OP name here, if each layer is in skip layers, then it could just uh, continue the for loop. And if it's not skip, in skip layers, then it will do the same thing here um, to, get the, uh, to load the weights, the biases and weights in, in the convolutional layers. So now we have to create this NumPy file of our checkpoint. So the checkpoint is a pre-trained weights and uh, biases. Now these values are now have to be converted into a NumPy uh, file. That we will done in the Jupyter Notebook. So here in transfer learning um, section, now this is the point where you can actually load the checkpoint and turn it into a NumPy file. So um, this file path is the file path of your um, the checkpoint file. Now here are we're going to use the checkpoint 
of what's called the speech command. So this speech command is a data set of human voices, but larger um, classes. It's, it has 20 classes, so it's, uh, it has more data than, the, than our original um, speech command 0 through 9 data set. So I already trained a model with this speech command data set, and the checkpoint is located in training, speech command, checkpoint and the 10th epoch pile. So these are the actual checkpoint where the weights and biases are saved. So we can load this by using the saver. And here, we actually restore um, the model. Then, uh, this is the part where we actually save it into an output file. Now, the output file is called um, sc underscore epoch 10 numpy. Because it's speech command, we train it with speech command, and this is the after 10 epoch. So, when we load this, now it says it's restoring parameters from this checkpoint. And then it will create this um, numpy file. in this same directory that the Jupyter Notebook is located, which is probably going to be here, right? Which is in AlexNet. And this is now the NumPy file. So if you want to just open it, so this NumPy file contains all of the weights that we have. Um, so this is how you can actually load the weights from speech command, uh, uh, load the weights from uh, source task, and then you can fine tune it for your own task. So transfer learning is um, generally used in a lot of circumstances. So if you're doing an image domain, now you can use the ImageNet data set, which is a very, which is a huge standard benchmark data set in the vision area. Uh, which is composed of 1,000 classes. So um, the concept of transfer learning is to, now if, you, uh, if your model, if there is a model that learns about the, what, what's in the images, then it will probably, in, inside these layers, it will, it will know, some layer will identify curves, some layers can identify the edges, and so on and so on. So we want this um, very important knowledge to be, tra to be transferred to our task. So for example, now, um, so in my research domain, when I do scene text detection, which is finding text, finding the location of the text um, in images, now we use the pre-trained uh, model from image to data set, so that since we're dealing with images, oh, we're not doing a classification task, but since we're also dealing with images, these pre-trained models can be used Valuably. So um, now these transfer learning, it, uh, since we have to like do fine tuning, uh, this can be looked a bit rigid. So the field of transfer learning is now developed in like domain adaptation, finding like the distribution of task A and task B, and then to embed um, the knowledge from task A to, to task B. So this is a very, very direct way that uh, direct but works very well. So you can dig deep into this whole field of transfer learning, domain adaptation, uh, in, in a lot of domains, not just in classification tasks, but in like generative models, where GANs are very known for catastrophic forgetting and so on. So actually, in this tutorial, the IPYMB, we have this, we can actually inference What's hap like we, we want to just test uh, with our sample data set. So we can use this part of the Jupyter Notebook to test our um, each scenario with this checkpoint. Okay. If you want, first want to check this baseline model, then you can just type baseline, which is the, um, the checkpoint in training baseline. Now we can 
uh, load this. And then we want to check with only the um, clean ones, not with the noise, noisy data, right? We, won't, we only want to check with the sample data set, but with the clean version. So this is the identifier in our actual data, uh, in our actual data here. So uh, without this noise, and the, and, and, um, the file ends with underscore zero. So that's how I identified, I, I discriminated. And we just, we're going to just randomly sample three files from, the, from this image, whole image directory. So let's see what files are randomly selected. Now, the six, eight, nine are randomly selected. Now, so this is where we're going to load our placeholders and the model. So, um, now here we only set the placeholder of X because this is a testing, so we don't have the label info. We're supposed to not have the label information. So that's why we only have the X where this images, these images are going to put into with the size of 227 by 227. And this key prob um, is for dropout, which is um, a, a method, a technique used to prevent overfitting. So here, we define our AlexNet model of number of classes of 10. And by inferencing, so now in model that inference is um, a forward propagation of your input of value. So your input value uh, propagates in inside your model, then comes up the output, which is the um, fully connected layer which has the length of 10 classes, each of probability. So using that, you can score our results. Now the saver is called in order to restore our checkpoint of our pre-trained models, right? Okay, and this is where we actually put our, um, put the data into this placeholder. So, here, we're actually going to run this session to get the score. So the forward propagation scores by putting our actual image, these random images, into the X placeholder. Hmm, there's an error. Uh, send shapes of both tensors to match. Oh, okay. Okay, the, I think the problem is because um, we have this model, like we have the graph already loaded in this, in the process of making our um, transfer learning. So here to convert, load the checkpoint and turn it into NumPy file, we already loaded the graph. So this is like a Jupyter thing. So Jupyter here, it has a temporary memory that actually saved this model graph, so if we just, we started, and then it will, yeah, the inference happens. Okay, it missed one. Does it sound like three? No. Zero. Okay, so this is how you can actually just inference it. Inference with your sample data sets. Now you can change these inference codes um, by here loading another checkpoint. So loading another scenario, you can, uh, and you can, so here now I just grab um, the whole list of sample images and then randomly select only three files from the image directory, which is going to be a list of three, uh, three path. So this is like the root, the, the path of the files that we will test. So if you want to, like in the case, like if you want to actually test with the 
um, data that you select, you can actually change this part to just inference what you want to. Um, so, uh, did you try inferencing with your, by yourself? So, now that's transfer learning. Um, so, we have some ideas of transfer learning, so we can always look into the tensor board again of how the training went with um, speech command. Now, speech, if you see speech command, um, before, all of these steps here were ended at 1K, which is 1,000 steps, but here it's 3,000 steps. This is not because I um, intentionally set to do more steps of training here. This is because, um, so the model, when you train the model, it's composed of, uh, you're training, you're not training the model with the whole batch of the data, but you're doing a mini, ba mi mini batch training. So if the data set is like, 10,000, then you're selecting like 32 files from the whole data set and you train with 32 files at parallel. So um, if you have more data set, then you will probably have more of those batches, right? So um, the iteration is referred to the one step of training your one mini batch and then when you, uh, when the training happens with all of those mini batches in a training set, then that's called one epoch. So we're trying to do a training with 10 epochs, but here, since we have more data in the speech command data set, which is the source task here, which has, which usually when you use transfer learning, this task, source task has more data set, like I told you about ImageNet. So it has more steps. And this validation accuracy is very, very low because I used the um, speech command zero through nine data set to do the validation. Okay, so this is transfer learning. And now the fourth one is um, generating synthetic data. So uh, I think generating synthetic data is actually um, the the things that you can intentionally do in like that people no, not normally do, but you can intentionally try to do to increase your um, size of data. So in my research domain, now doing OCR, then um, we're making more images with texts. So texts you can just generate very easily just by typing or just making fonts. So if there's like random um, images, then as backgrounds, we're just going to make, uh, we can just syn synthesize these uh, fake images, synthetic data very easily. With, um, there are engines like MJ Synth and that, you, that they enable um, to generate these synthetic data. So when you use synthetic data, it's, you have to be very careful because synthetic data uh, in most cases, we'll have different distributions with the real data set. So um, the proportion of synthetic data and real data will have to be carefully manipulated by doing a lot of experiments. And also, when you create synthetic data, you have to re reasonably keep checking with the distribution of the real data set. So this is kind of a tricky part to do, and there are a lot of um, models there are a lot of methods to generate synthetic data. Some of them are not deep learning methods. Some of them are deep learning methods. Here, I brought um, some GAN related works. So now again, GAN, Generative Adversarial Network, um, was is a very. It's also a huge um, area in the vision er, in the vision field. So. GENs are, to just give you a brief introduction of GENs. Now, GENs are like, it's composed of two networks. So the task here is to generate um, realistic images. So there's a generator that tries to generate realistic images, and there's a discriminator who tries to discriminate between real images and fake images generated by the generator. So this is like, um, the famous metaphor of GENs are 
now generator is making like a de de deficit, counterfeit, counterfeit money, and discriminator is like a police officer who's um who's who wants to identify this counterfeit money. And now if the police is first now, now when this training starts, probably the generator will be very bad at training, bad at making. So like bad at making um, counterfeit money, but police like discriminating would be fairly like relatively easier task. So then, just um, the criminal who makes uh, counterfeit money will go into prison, and then after the uh, criminal comes out, will try to make another counterfeit money, and so that's like the process of um, training generating becomes better, and the discriminator becomes better. So by this process, we're expecting the generator to create realistic images that this discriminator cannot discriminate from real images. So now conditional GANs are different in that just normal GANs uh, cannot control the, the contents of what's being created. So uh, for example, in, in an MNIST data set, which is zero, just, just an image of zero, one, two, and these numbers, and then uh, using the GANs to, ge to generate these kind of MNIST images, then if, even we want to create um, intentionally number one, we, there's no way to do that with just normal GANs. So conditional GAN is to add this kind of condition to the gener when, when, when we're generating, so that we can actually generate a condition, a controlled um, image. So the CGANs can be used in our task uh, since we have classes, 10 classes. So we can generate each of the classes. So actually I try to do this task first, but then now GANs are very, very unstable to train because the, the GAN training itself is like the fight between two um, networks, who's going to do better, better, better. So it's very unstable to train. Now CGANs uh, and just normal GANs are quite, um, they are like the initial GANs that are um, proposed. So they're quite unstable. But then now after some period, some time, now cycle GAN um, popped up in this generative um, adversarial network field, which uses the cycle consistency loss which kind of stabilizes the training. So uh, when I try to uh, trying to create spectrogram images with the CGAN, it kind of worked, um, the fidelity of the audio was not really good. So I just skipped this part. Now CGAN is not really working for this task. But now we can use cycle GANs to work for this task because now cycle GAN, why, why is it stable? Because it uses the cycle consistency um, loss and what's different from just normal GANs are like, cycle GAN is called uh, one image to image transfer, so like style transfer. So in this case scenario, now this, you, can, you can train um, images with uh, a horse and then another class with zebra. So uh, if we train images with um, horses and images with zebras, then what we want to do is if we put in an image of horse, we want to transfer this image into a, a zebra image. So that's like style, uh, style tra image to image transfer. So the model before CycleGen is called Pix to Pix, and these models needed like a supervised setting of like a paired setting of these image to image transfer. So if it had, a, so the data set is like, if you have this this kind of image, then you need to have the same image, but only the horses change to zebra, like this one and this one. Well, this is really, really hard to have this kind of data set. So uh, pix to pix was a very good uh, model, but now it had a lot of limitations in terms of application. But CycleGen here doesn't need that um, direct supervision, doesn't need that an paired annotation. It, it, just, it can just have uh, one data set of horses and one data set of zebras and it will just auto, it will try to learn what's horses, what zebras and then convert um, what we want to change to uh, 
just horses to zebras. So this works with two domains, so A to B or B to A. Now in this scenario, what I try to do is um, how can style transfer be applied to our task when we're doing audio um, speech classification models? So what I thought was that, like what I actually did when I was cr tr training a Parkinson's disease classification model is that now human voices have certain features that are, uh, can be categorized. So for example, uh, we can categorize human voices by gender. We can categorize by ages. Uh, we can categorize, even categorize by the distance of, with the, of persons with the mic. So there are a few things that could be categorized. So in this case, I try to do it with gender. So there's this open source data set of um, gender data set. Now one is with female, one is with male. So now what we can do is we can train this cycle again to actually um, learn about female voices and then male voices. So what we want to do is we want if we have a certain type, certain, so our speech command 0 through 9 data set is probably be composed of women and men. And what I want to do is I want to convert the female voices into male and male voices into female. That will uh, double the data set, right? So this is another augmentation technique that you can do. This is more of um, utilizing external information since we're training a separate data set of gender. Now the ideal, ta ideal scenario would be when we have our speech command 0 through 9 data set um, separated by gender. But that's not the case. Our speech command 0 through 9 is separated by class labels, the utterances, not gender. So now when you use cycle again, I just, what I did here in this task was I just trained, I just modified the whole data set to female and the whole data set into male. So that will be three times the data set. So what I assumed is that this cycle again, um, so if we try to convert male into male, I presume that this identity, this feature's identity will be um, preserved. So actually Cyclegen paper has this kind of specific loss, identity loss, which is um, if you try to convert male into male, then it's, it makes it an identity function. So it train, it's a specific loss to make that into male into male. So preserve that identity. So uh, you can actually put that kind of losses into your Cyclegen when you're training. So um, now that's what I did in this task. So we have, we can um, triple the size of the data set that we're using. In the pre-trained models, I told you to, there were two zip files in the um, drive. So one is AlexNet checkpoints here, and one is the checkpoint JN, which is the checkpoint of um, Cyclegen. So now we will try to actually inference now, we'll try to actually convert these images into female and also into male. So that directory is located in cycle again, here. Now, what we want to do is when you um, look at this file, now this is the main test.py, which we will use to inference, which we will use to do the image to image transfer of Cyclegen. Now these are the arguments that we're supposed to add. So now just, um, let's open another window. Okay, so let's go into our repository and then Cyclegen. So now uh, we're going to call Python. So this is a Python file, so Python and then main test.py. So we want to run this file. But then now we have to put the arguments to set which direction, which data set we're going to use, which, um, which checkpoint are we going to load, so things like that. So now data set dir is going to be our first argument and just type in SCO9, which is supposed to be 
here, we have to create a file of data sets which we want to um, transfer, we, which we want to do an image to image transfer. So in this data sets file, we need to have the SC09 data set, which is located here, of course, in data, SC09. So just copy it and put it in cycle again, data sets, and just paste it. So this SC09 data set has these kind of files. So we don't want to inference all of these files, we just want to inference only like these clean WAV files, like three fi clean files each um, in each class. So that we will handle in our model test.py. So if you have like an editor, text editor, we have to edit this file. Now if you go into model underscore test.py and just search def test. So this is the part where we call the test function. Now it's originally this is going to um, inside the data sets, inside the data sets that we set, SC09. Now it's this is originally formed to just bring all the files inside those data set file folder. But what we want to do is we only want to uh, pull dot .wav file, but only the clean version. So this is what you do, what you change here. And also, same thing for the um, opposite direction. So when I trained this model originally, I, um, I did, did um, female as A and male as B. So A to B would be female to male and vice versa for B to A. Okay, so are you on the same page? Uh, here. In model underscore test.py, find def test, test function, and then we only have to change this part. So this was originally just asterisk dot asterisk, which is supposed, supposed to bring all of the files. But since we only want to bring um, WAV files, clean WAV files, what we're going to do is uh, change the extension to dot WAV, and then add uh, underscore zero before the extension so that we can only bring the um, clean WAV files so, see, in the data sets, since we did that um, noisy augmentation and we also converted wave files into, sorry, this is this supposed to be JPG, not wave, sorry. Yeah, since we have, uh, so the cycle again is an image to image transfer, so it deals with spectrogram images in this case. So now these wave files and noisy JPG files are all unnecessary. So this is how we filter out. So can we move on? Okay, so um, what we want to do here is that we only want to inference, so we want, only want to do style to style transfer with the original data set, the, the clean WAV files. So this is how we filter out unnecessary data from our data sets, which is mixed. So now you save this. Save this. So this is how we change it. So that's the first argument that we will put. And then what we have to do is we have to define the direction of this conversion. That will be argument which underscore direction, which direction. Now this has to be either A to B or B to A. So female to male, now in this case we will do female to male, A to B. Okay, so that's it for that. And then we have to also load the checkpoints of our GANs. So I already trained um, CycleGAN um, before coming here. 
So we can move these. So now you have all um, downloaded this checkpoints ckpt underscore gen. If we're coming here now, what we'll do is we'll just copy and paste these files into the cyclegen directory here, just like this. So this would be the checkpoint of cyclegen, and then this would be the logs. So for the tensorboard. So um, the checkpoint name is automatically set as the data set directory underscore uh, 256, which is the image size. Okay, so now we can set um, the checkpoint directory. It's default um, checked as current, current path checkpoint. So, yeah, actually we don't have to set it again. It's defaultly set. So now we're going to set the um, path for where our train, where our style um, image to image transfer data set will be created. So that will be test dirt. Now I would like to generate this in the current directory test and A to B. So, yep. I guess this is the it, this is it for um, the arguments. Then if you enter, okay, so it's reading checkpoint, loading success, and then now it's processing the images at the location that we set. So here, now this is new, test, A to B, and then these files are generated. So probably these, um, these lines here seem very um, unnatural. These, is, these are probably uh, from converting the padding so when we saw the data um, spectrum images, we saw some white lines, blanks, that we, um, we made by padding. So that's probably because of that. Okay, so this is how we can actually transfer, um, like change the gender of the images. So now we did this for um, female to male. And then we can also do the same thing, but male to female. So we can change the test directory first from A to B to B to A, and then direction also to B to A. So you can also just, just type this, and then it will just create another B to A directory here, and then all of them. So um, this way, you have A to B, so male to female, and also uh, female to male. So that will be um, twi twice the data set. And then you have the original ones that are not converted. So now you have three times the data set enlarged. So by doing this, we have a lot more treating data to train with the model. And um, this enlargement is, will be quite, um, have contained more information. So when you do data augmentation, it's kind of, sometimes it could be um, meaningless if you just keep using the information you already have in the data set. But this kind of using style gains, like um, image to image transfer, then what you're doing is you're kind of bringing the information outside this data set. So it will, I'm assuming that this kind of work with three times the data set will um, give positive impacts on the accuracy. Okay, now mine is done. So, so when you train Cyclegen, now um, in the audio domain, so when you're doing with images, the easiest thing um, to check your uh, training is you can just 
use your eyes to check how it's complete. So is this um, image realistic? So that's how you can just keep track of the training of um, psychogens and gens. But in audio, by just looking at these audio data, can we be sure that um, the psychogen generated the um, rightly com like converted female into male? So we can't really be sure about this. So uh, what I do is I, can, I use a VGD classifier, so like a classification model in the training process. So when I did, uh, when I, when I did this same task with my um, uh, Parkinson's disease diagnosis classifier, what I did was I added a classification loss in the process so that each time it's generating the, um, these models, the, you know, these images, I'm using a classification model to check whether these um, labels are correct. So a uh, classifier, like the baseline classifier model we already trained that are kind of doing good per performance uh, with classifying these tasks, we're using the same classifier to just check whether GAN training is working or not. So that's one thing that you can do. And the easy, or, or the another just easy path is you can actually convert these spectrogram images to um, WAV files, but this would be lossy. The process would be data, uh, would have a data loss. So when you hear it, the fidelity will be quite low. But if you need like raw, um, so in this case, we want to create like a classification model, which needs to well capture the uh, features of the classes. Now, it doesn't have to be good quality. It can just capture the good features. That's why I'm using a classification model in this task and it works. But there's an alternative also. So the work that I did in deep learning camp uh, last summer was to actually make a conditional wave gen. So wave gen is, um, is a gen that's purpose to generate just raw audio not just like spectrum images. So you can just directly listen to the synthesized um, audio. And this is, the conditional wave gen is to just like CGAN version, just like conditional wave gen, but like a little twig, twig, um, architectural tweak to deal with audio data. So you can also check out my work here and use this task to do data augmentation. So with these, um, augmented data. I've already had these checkpoints ready here. Now this is called gender gen. So you can load the tensor board to check its validation accuracy. But since gender again, this step, step is the last uh, technique, last, last method of our tutorial. So we'll try to just um, load all of these checkpoints to compare the validation accuracy. Now you do this by now you do this by um, going to classifier. Now my current directory is with tutorial slash classifier. Now we have this training here. So this training con training directory contains all of these checkpoints, right? So what I'm going to do is. I'm going to call TensorBoard and then set the log directory as just training, current directory and then slash training. So that way, that way, all of the um, files from all um, checkpoint, all directories can be loaded at once. So we can actually compare all of them at once. So what we need to compare is the validation accuracy. Now the orange one is the one from speech command, training speech command and transfer learning. So I told you that I tested with the um, speech command zero through nine data set. So that validation accuracy is poor, has to be poor. So you, we're just going to get rid of this validation and check out these, these ones. then just lower the smoothing. So when we compare these validation accuracies, 
The highest one is um, the gender again. The third one, the red one, which has the um, accuracy of 95.71. So there was like 1% gain from the baseline model, which is quite a lot. When you come up to 90%, uh, it's really, really hard to just increase a percent in the accuracy. And the second, um, the next highest is the fine-tuned one, 94.57%. Um, then it's baseline and then it's noisy. So the reason why noisy is um, doing the worst performance is because, like I said, um, it, the train data, the uh, train data is composed of noisy data. So the model is learning to deal with noises, but then the validation set has are just um, clean speech recorded from a studio environment. So that's why the noisy train noisy validation is the lowest that's logical and then there's baseline which is 94.2 then it's fine tuning so the reason why gender again so um three times triple augmented data set is the highest of all is because it has the like i said external information that just um that's very very relevant to your data set so it's your just own data it's my data but then I convert my own voices into a male voice, which will give more additional information from the, from the data set of gender data set that we had. So this is like training happens, like the synthesis uh, training happens with another data set, but we're just, um, just using the knowledge there to uh, augment our data set. So that's like very, uh, it's, it's kind of, I think it's a clever trick to do uh, when, when the, situation is right, appropriate. And then the fine tuning is, um, fine tuning is like, you, well, you have to try to do a lot of experiments to get the best results in fine tuning. So you can uh, control how many layers, control the number of layers you want to train, or you can uh, like, you can add more layers, not replacing it, or you can just replace the thing. So there are many options you can try in fine tuning. So that's it with the comparing, comparison. And then the very quick analysis of all of these um, steps is that first one, noisy training for application in the real world, which is going to be very essential to your task if it's um, doing real-time application with your mobile um, application, like if you do it real-time with TensorFlow Lite, then that could be very needy. And then fine tuning, second point, fine tuning works in most cases if you have uh, similar domains. So it's really important to find a similar, um, that has a, 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 a large benchmark data set that has the similar tasks. So um, when we're applying machine learning in like startups or in just by yourself or like in just research, that are not related to just improving deep learning technology itself, then when you use deep learning, when you try to use deep learning, you will probably be in a situation that you have um, lack, of, uh, lack, lack of data. Then you got to find similar domains. If it's images, then try to image net. If you're audio, then you can also try the speech command data set. So um, since there are many, um, like even in text, even in text and even in like um, videos. So like for example, if, you're, if there is a trained model with English in natural language processing, but now you want to create like a Korean model, then um, you just, you, you can't just really start from the scratch. You have to get the, restore the information from the image English domains. So that's like a tricky part in this NLP to if there's a language difference, you want to get that, um, so that's like the domain adaptation to um, restore the knowledge. So there's like a whole paper list to help you do guide that. And then number three is, yeah, like I pointed out, synthetic and real data have different distributions. So if you're using GANs, now in our scenario, it worked out pretty well because um, the scenario was well schemed for this kind of task. But then in your case, if there are not really... Um, 
di discrete features, like if your data cannot be categorized with an apparent standard, and you don't have like a large data set to train the GANs, so GANs also need a lot of data set too. So then you should not use like psych GANs or GANs to do, the, do so, do the same thing. Uh, but, but GANs may be unstable and work in a limited cases in data augmentation, but you have, like I said, a lot of engines, uh, non-deep learning engines to, to do the same task, to synthesize images. Okay, I think this is the last slide. So, um, yeah. So this is the end of the tutorial, and it's kind of, um, well, I'm not sure if I actually gave you like the right scenario of how these data augmentation techniques can be applied, but if you have any questions along the process, now you have the repository that has the um, AlexNet CNN classifier and all the codes for data augmentation. So don't use this Jupyter file, but you can... Now just the Jupyter file is just to, just for demonstration, but the whole files here in processing, there's file to text, there's noise.py, which adds noises, um, wave to image here. So these, use these Python, each scripts to do so. So, and this cyclegen2 classifier and so on and so on. So, thank you very much. Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Um, okay, so it's about your waveguide, which okay. is generating uh, synthetic audio. Mm -hmm. My question is, is your input uh, also audio or are you inputting um, a spectrogram? Um, so, GENs are like, you don't put the, some kind of meaningful data as an input, you just put like the random um, vector as an input, so that you're training um, the random vector and the, what the data we want to create, and we're training this embedding processes. So, we're putting a noise, just a random distribution of uh, vector, and then putting into a generator so that it makes, um, it makes the here, it's going to be raw audio, but in just normal GANs, that will be images. So GANs are like, you're actually creating some images or some audio out of scratch. Okay, and then, so when you wanna check that your audio is actually the number A, somebody saying the number A, do you have to listen to it or do you have, is your discriminator working on the MFCC or the filter band? Well, I think that's a really, really good question that we have to also tackle through. So just like GANs, like they do Turing tests, which is just looking with your eyes. That's like the just general case, general things to do, but they have like inception um, scores that's like using some classification tasks to label them. So that can be applied um, similarly in our task too. So uh, most of the cases, we just listen to it, but we're trying to, like that's like one of the issues like in GENs overall. So here now we're using both like inception scores and then the um, uh, just listening to it. So then we, if we want to do inception scores, we also have to do it with the spectrum images. So, yep. Any questions like along the way? Uh, if you had errors or like. Oh, I have another question. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> no. Um, so you, um, you talked about spectrograms mm -hmm. and one of your slides had a male filter band. However, it seems like you're just using uh, regular spectrograms here. So, which one did you actually use? This, this spectrogram. It's just a regular one. Okay. So, like, MFCC is not just MFCC, we just use spectrogram from Matplotlib. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can also use MFCCs and... Um, and derivatives and... Yeah. But then here, like, we wanted to tackle, like, as in just, like, images of, like, um, size 227 by 227, so it was better for me to use the spectrum image in this case. Okay, thank you. Yep. Sorry, uh, is this method scalable for longer utterances than one second digit? Uh, I think that's a really, really good question. Uh, well, like, like I said, audio data, it's really, really hard to generate from just scratch using like this kind of wave gun. So my work um, worked with the speech command zero through nine data set, but it doesn't really work well with the long data set. But here, our data augmentation technique, the scenarios are we work with spectrum images, not like audio. So it's very easy to uh, reconstruct, reconstruct, like construct from scratch, 
synthesize. So I think this is very scalable in terms of length of audio. But then now then you have to adjust how to make this spectrogram images. So here it's just 512 data plots by three, 384 overlap. But then now you have to change those plots, plottings, and then um, you have to also deal with the sequential information. Since so like here, it's just classification model. So uh, we don't think about the sequences. We're just like getting the whole file, one, one second whole file into a spectrogram image and then using a classification task. But then like in automatic speech recognition where it's like a long sequence of audio speech, then the sequences are what's very important. So in that case, um, these kind of augmentation techniques should not be used because those data are not used to deal with spectral images from the point. But if the task, if your main task in a scenario is to deal with those kind of data, then um, these scenarios will work fine. Any other questions? Uh, I was wondering, in, maybe this is a more general question for uh, uh, guns, but how how do you know that the this well how do you know when to stop the training? Um, okay. Because if you're discriminated yeah. does very badly, then mm -hmm. it's sort of your goal for it to do badly on mm -hmm. the one hand. But on the other hand, it's um, um, mm -hmm. it's also your starting point, right? Yeah. And it, you have this interaction between the uh, generator and the discriminator. So, uh, I mean, in the beginning, yeah. uh, you generate bad examples, so your discriminator does um, fair. I mean, uh, before you train it, it doesn't know how to discriminate, but uh, how do you know when to stop? How do you know that you're not uh, converging to some... Yeah, so um, the task of GENs are to generate realistic images. So in the process of training, we're just going to keep generating like these images with the generator. So you can uh, check it by your eyes. So the losses are really hard to kind of judge with the losses. So people who are dealing with GENs usually just check it by um, eyes. But that happens when your training is stable. So in the first half, it, the training will take a long time. Like my WaveGEN took like three to four days with um, NVIDIA like V10. So it's, it takes a lot of time. Um, but then like in such cases, you want to know whether this uh, losses are spiking or not. So there's this like certain behaviors that you can check in the losses. So um, I can actually show you the loss here since we have the checkpoint. Okay. Mm. So this is what happens, like discriminator loss and a generator loss. So there's a lot of variances in these models. That's why I'm telling you that these are quite relatively unstable. When we compare that those into just these kind of data points. So, um, So you can like, if, and there's like a general behavior that can be cap captured. So if your losses are like spiking, very spiking, then um, training is going wrong. And you, you have to adjust like a, so like when you're dealing with some very hard task to generate, like task, like you're using the, like when the task is too difficult for the generator, then you have to make the task for the generator much more difficult. So you can adjust the learning rate or you can like um, intentionally add noises to noises, or you can like, if there's um, half of the, like some 10, like 1% one one or like 10% of the labels, you can give false labels to just give, like, make the training of generator harder. So there is a lot of hyperparameter tuning is required in this um, training process. So um, there's this paper called the GEN landscape. This is an 
ICML paper that kind of like summarizes the whole hyperparameter tuning methods. And I think this is a very good um, paper to, to look through to get the hang of these um, stabilizing GANs. And then sometimes uh, it should work like, see if you see the d discriminator is working fine and then it becomes harder and then it's working fine, becomes harder. So there has to be this kind of cycle because um, the training is happened not like in a one step, but it's like generator ha um, trains stops, discriminator train stops, generator. So it's like a cycle of these sequences. So um, these kind of signs of discriminator, ha lo when, when it's training, the losses have to drop, but then when it, the train stops and the generator training is happening and the generator is becoming better, then the discriminator has to be, there has to be a leap of this increase of loss in the process. So these are some behaviors that you can check with these um, sta stabilizing your GAN, GAN training. But it's generally, it's kind of difficult to train GANs if, um, if so you have to do some kind of tuning method and so on and so on. But cycle GAN is uh, very, very stable, I think, like relatively very stable in this GAN field. Oh, and you can also use this paper called Stargen. So, uh, so like Cyclegen has only like two domains. So image to image transfer. So if we want to deal with ages, we can only do like um, people under 30, people over 30. So binary image to image transfer. But Stargen is a paper, uh, the author is actually, he works right next to me. <laughs> he sees, uh, and this is like a multiple domain image-to-image tra -image transfer. So you can set like multiple of classes, like teenagers, 20s, 30s, 40s, and then transfer tens of uh, teenagers into 40s, 40s into 20s. So these kind of manipulation can be done in Stargen, and Stargen is quite stable to train, so you can use Stargens in other scenarios. Yeah. So there are like a whole lot of um, types of GENs, GEN models, so it's a good place to yeah, just search for if you're doing data augmentation. Okay, okay. So thank you for um, sparing your valuable time. Thank you.